Good morning and welcome to the public part of the 25th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please ask all people present to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? Uh, I would remind, oh, sorry, I would like to point out that Mike Rumbles has given his apologies for, this, uh, for not being able to attend this meeting. The agenda item two, which is a part of the European Union Withdrawal Act, and it's to look at heavy goods and maritime transport. It's a consideration of two proposals by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating on two statutory instruments. And for clarity, these are the heavy goods vehicle charging for the use of certain infrastructure on trans-European road network, open brackets, amendment, close brackets, open brackets, EU exit regulations 2018, quite a mouthful, and the maritime transport access to trade and cabotage. Cabotage, nice to be corrected, and I'm sorry I've got that wrong, regulations 2018. These instruments are being laid in relation to the European Withdrawal Act 2018. Under the categorisation proposals set out in the protocol between the Parliament and the Scottish Government for handling such consent notices, they both have been categorised by the Scottish Government as making minor or technical amendments. No comments have been received in relation to these proposals. Is the Committee therefore agreed that it should write to the Scottish Government to confirm that it is content for a UK statutory instrument to be given? We are all agreed. We'll therefore move on to agenda item three, which is Transport Scotland Bill. And this is our third evidence session for the Transport Scotland Bill. We're going to take evidence from two panels. Uh, we'll first look at the proposal in the bill which relate to smart ticketing. Uh, the committee will then take evidence on the bill on proposals to bus services. Firstly, I'd like to welcome George Mayer, the Director of Scotland Confederation of Passenger Transport, Simon Hume, IT Director, CalMac Limited, and Robert Sampson, Senior Stakeholder Manager for Transport Focus. Good morning. Um, I assume you've all given evidence, well, I know some of you have, you've all given evidence at a committee before. Don't worry about pushing the buttons. Simon, well, for your benefit, don't worry about pushing the buttons. Um, somebody will do that for you. And if you look at me, if you want to answer a question, I'll bring you in on the question. I'll try and get, get you all in. And um, Simon, just in case if you see me waving my pe pen frantically, that means your time is almost up. But the first question on this session is coming from Richard Lyle. Richard. Yes, thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, to move on to the, fa the factor of uh, key smart ticketing, I note that getting Glasgow moving argues that the transport bill must include powers so that the local transport authorities can enforce an affordable daily price cap across all public transport within the city region, maybe a commendable uh, notion. So do you think there is a need for a national technological standard for smart ticketing? And if so, what benefits might it bring? Simon, would you? As, as, as CalMac, we are we're very supportive of adopting standards and working together with other industry bodies. Uh, we're already members of some forums that have discussed smart ticketing in the past. And we think there's a huge benefit, not just in looking at it unilaterally, just obviously from our own business, business but from the ferry business, but for us to be able to work in conjunction with the bus companies and the rail companies, both of which we think are hugely advantageous to the Scottish islands and the Scottish economy, we're absolutely very supportive of having a standard, uh, for, uh, standard protocol, standard uh, to work to, which I think will help all of our software suppliers work together, and I think ultimately should give us a more streamlined solution and potentially a more cost-effective solution. Robert. Yes, from a passenger perspective, a, a national technological standard would assist passengers having just the need for in the medium term, one ticket would do across all modes of all operators, be it bus, ferry, underground rail, the same national technological standard or common framework, and it would make it easier for one integrated smart product uh, for passengers to use rather than the need of a, a multiplicity of tickets. Uh, I, was, I was in London uh, 
month or two ago, and we got the Oyster card. I was on buses, I was on trains, I was on the underground, uh, I was on the riverboat, I was even on the, um, an airline zip line across the, if you know where I am, in Docklands. I was even on Docklands, uh, Docklands trains. Oyster card, oyster card, oyster card. Although, once that ran out, you could also use your um, contactless card. So, it works in a city. Would this system work in a country? Um, George. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we're on the road to that. Um, we have a standard. It said so 2.1.4. And that means that the operators in Scotland, bus, uh, coach, um, train, ferries, can all work on that platform. We've agreed to that. Uh, and it's in operation now. Um, we gave a, a commitment to the Minister for Transport last two years ago that we would introduce multi-operator, bus to bus, initially, in the main urban areas of Scotland. Uh, we've delivered that, Aberdeenshire, Aberdeen City, Dundee, Glasgow, uh, and the east of Scotland, from Dundee to the borders, uh, as far as shots to the west, you have a ticket that can give you multi-bus journeys as an initial platform, but the plan is to build and geographically spread that and then build it and work with partners at ferries, rail, so that we can have a ticket that you can use across the different modes in Scotland. Uh, we've, we felt it was really important not to try and go in and build the roof, um, because if you've no supports to that roof, the danger is it would collapse. So what we've done is we've built it for the base up, the building blocks are there, the, the standards are there, and we can push on now, work with colleagues uh, to deliver an integrated ticket across Scotland. So it is coming. So you, you would... Richard, just, just, sorry, Richard, I am going to interrupt you, and I'm going to bring uh, Colin in, because you're stressing, straying into an area that he identified that he'd like to ask about. So, Colin, would you like to talk about the Oyster Card Act? It's interesting, Mr Mayor, you talk about the industries doing certain things to, to develop that in, in geographical areas, but the reality is in London you have a, an Oyster Card, which is introduced by you know, Transport London, that covers every single... Um, a bus company that covers the whole city. Why have we not achieved that in Scotland? Why do we not have a single smart card that covers the whole of Scotland in all forms of transport at the moment? And significantly, do you think the provisions in the bill will deliver that? Or will we certainly have this sort of ad hoc growth um, in, in different companies' uh, cards? I mean, why have we not got an Oyster card for Scotland at the moment? What's preventing that? And will the bill achieve that? One of the things that we were asked to include within the, the smart ticket range that we've, that we've developed across Scotland, um, for we're seeing significant take-up, um, was that we would, uh, each card, although it would have its own branding, would have the standard salt air um, brand on it as well, so that it could be recognised as a, a Scotland-wide card and be recognised as a card that ultimately you'd be able to use in the different public transport uh, forms in Scotland. We are different to London, and an Oyster card has been great, but it's dying, and it, new, new technology is moving on. So we've got, to, we've got to keep pace up, we've got to keep ahead of that game, but there is the opportunity to have a salt tyre card that will deliver the kind of things that, that you're looking for across Scotland on the different modes. With respect, the, the Oyster, we are not even close to the Oyster card in Scotland at the moment. You, you say that you have the technology to allow this to happen. It's not happening across Scotland. So why? I mean, the Oyster card is ultimately being reduced in numbers because people are using their bank card. Frankly, we're not at Oyster card yet, never mind using our bank card to get around Scotland. If I jump on a bus in Dumfries, there's no chance of me being able to basically have my bank card used and then get off a bus in Aberdeen and be charged the, 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 the several journeys I've made uh, in a competitive way at the moment because there is no crossover between Dumfries and Galloway and other parts of Scotland. So why are we not even at Oyster card level, never mind what is going to ultimately probably replace place Oyster Card, which is the use of your, your bank card. What's stopping that happening? Well, I, I think we, we, we felt in discussions with Transport Scotland, we felt that we were really at crossroads, that we had one technology, it's a bit like VHS and, and Betamax, that you, you were at a point, a tipping point, that said, well, if you go the Betamax route, that is going to die, it will, it will die a death, because of the success that we'd seen in other parts of the country, 
moving transport onto contactless payment. Um, so for us, um, that was a, a right decision. It was a, a sensible thing to do. Rather than investing a lot of cash, time and effort into something that was going to die, it was more sensible to look at contactless and move on on that basis, because it offers up so many different options going forward. The contactless is there now, will we'll change and develop in the years ahead. Um, sorry, I'm going to bring Robert in, but just to, uh, just to comment is when we spoke to Transport for London last week, they very much said the Oyster card would never die, uh, on the basis there would be some people that w wouldn't have a banker's card or the ability to use that, and therefore they'll be using Oyster cards for the foreseeable future. Um, so I, I just float that. Robert, you wanted to come in, and then I'll come back to... Um, you, Colin, and, and back then to you, uh, Richard. Yeah, uh, just a couple. Yeah, just a couple of points. Uh, it has taken a very long time to even get where we are. I think it was first mentioned in Scotland's Transport Future in 2004, where the aim was to get one passengers be able to get one ticket that can get you anywhere in Scotland. You know, we're now sitting here 14 years later, and we haven't actually got there. Uh, why well, it's probably easier in London because of the, the setup of regulation, etc. In Scotland, the multiplicity of operators. Uh, but slowly we are getting there. But we have now got smart and geographical locations, as George has mentioned, in urban areas. Uh, the hope is that the technological standard in this uh, advisory group that the, the bill proposes will actually knit that all together. Uh, but it has taken longer than passengers would like to see delivered. It's gone back 14 years, to be honest about it. Colin, do you want to come in? Because I, I see Simon wants to come in as well. I just, I just come back to the, the further point. Will the provisions in the bill be sufficient to deliver what we're trying to achieve around a, a Scotland-wide smart card, like the Oyster card, particularly for those people who will never have a bank account, young people, children that have bank accounts, um, or an, and the fact that you could use your bank card to basically get round Scotland, because at the moment I can't use my bank card in a bus in Dumfries and Galloway. So will we have, will the bill deliver that as it stands at the moment, or do we need to change that bill to make sure that we're not having this conversation again in five years' time? Robert, the go for it, and then I'll bring yeah, Simon the, in. The, the, the bill delivers mechanisms for all the operators to get round the table and work together with goodwill. It doesn't actually give a legislation or enforce anyone to actually bring a, a national product. But from working with the industry and the operators, I see goodwill to actually deliver that. And they're doing it in geographical spots just now, but there's no legislation within the, the bill just now to actually enforce the delivery of a national uh, smart technology. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think there's probably two comments that maybe are worth saying. We see giving the choice to the customer as to how they pay for their travel as being fundamental. You know, there's a lot of talk about smart ticketing and whether you have a smart card, I think, is obviously has been the model up until now. We certainly see that using contactless cards is very much an expanding market. 63% of people in the UK have contactless. It's the most uh, 24 to 35 year old people are the most common people who use that. And we absolutely want to want to make sure we reach out to these people. But equally, as you rightly point out, not everyone has contactless. So in terms of where we envisage this, we see this as being particularly in some of the more challenging connectivity areas that we operate on the islands in some small ports. You know, we have to be very cognizant that we don't necessarily have the ability to have major big ticket machines on our ports. We have to be flexible and allow people that choice. Do we see that involving working very closely with the bus companies? For sure. Do we absolutely see bus sale as being a fundamental product that we want to offer? Yes. Similarly with rail sale, we'd have some of that, but we want to do a lot more of that. But our fundamental enabler is where we need the help of Transport Scotland is to enable us to move forward with our new booking and ticketing system, which has been under discussion with Transport Scotland for a number of years. But that is the fundamental enabler that will allow the ferry business, the CalMax ferry business, to really move forward and work with the companies that you're talking about. We absolutely want to go into modal. We want to offer the choice to the customer. But that is our ask and what we are needing and help from Transport Scotland to allow us to move that technology forward. Stuart, you want to come in briefly? Yes, I've got two quite small questions, convenient. Uh, 
the first of which sets context. Isn't the thing about the Oyster card that it allows an understanding of the journey the customer is making end to end to be decided not before it started, but after it's completed? And that is the, the key point, that you don't have to plan ahead. You just go, you make your journey, and then the system looks at the aggregation of all the different bits you've done and said, that's your journey, then it prices it. So is, is that a correct understanding of Oyster? I'm getting nodding heads. Right, let me now <laughs> ask the question. Because the... the, 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 the no, he did, actually. Yeah, yeah. OK. He, they all Sorry, nodded. I'm no quickly a mm -hmm. um, Now, in the bill, there is provision uh, for a national smart ticketing advisory board. But the one thing I don't think is in the bill, and I invite you to tell me this matters or doesn't, is that to enable you to do what Oyster does, to, at the end of the journey, look at all the components that have made it up, decide you what the journey is. There is you, you kind of need a clearinghouse for the data from all the different operators and so on, be they ferries, be they whatever, to come to a conclusion as what the journey is. But I see nothing in the bill that provides for that technical bit of gubbins, to use the technical term, that decides what the journey is. Is that a significant omission? Or is it by implication that the National Smart Ticketing Advisory Board will lead to that happening? Because if that doesn't happen, I don't see how you get to Scott, uh, the scallop card, or whatever you care, call it. George. I, I participate. Um, we, we were instrumental in, in working with Transport Scotland and putting in place the Smart Integrated Ticketing Board that we have. And on that board currently, we have uh, colleagues for ferries, we have ScotRail, uh, we have, uh, in fact, the only public, it's easier to say the ones that are not there, is, is the tram in Edinburgh, is the only one that's now represented. Um, so for me, it's an expansion of that board to include local authorities and the other transport operator that, that's now currently there. We, we've had these kind of discussions, and, and we recognise that in phase one of the, uh, the rollout of um, um, contactless payment, um, was simply um, buying the products that are there now. So it's a single fare or it's a day ticket or it can be a, a weekly ticket in some cases. Phase two of that is to then think about how do we replicate, and this, this is happening now in London uh, and also being discussed about in other parts of England and will we'll, we'll, we'll be f future discuss, discussions here in Scotland. Uh, so phase one, get the contactless system in and working uh, and buying the products that are there now. But we also have to keep an eye onto, onto the future to, to develop onto phase two of contactless, which allows the things that you've mentioned uh, to happen using contactless. So you um, have multiple journeys and, and you have a, a cap on the price for a day's travel, let's say. So these are being discussed just now. They will... Um, the expansion of the board will allow that to, to be developed. Sorry, sorry. Let me just try and quickly draw it to a conclusion. Yep. We are looking at a bit of legislation. At the end of the day, does this bill speed up the process of getting to that end point? Is, is really the question in terms of the legislation, I think. Yes, it will. Right, that's fine. Convener. I want to, to say whether it will speed it up or not. I think it will speed it up, but I think there's one aspect of it that we think is fundamental why that, rec that advisory board is so important. We see ferries as being slightly different. In some respects, it's almost more like an airline model because we need to know on a number of our routes, the routes are pre-booked. So customers have to make their choice in advance. We need to know that they're coming. And actually, that's an advantage because actually we can speed up the customer's experience then because we know who's coming and know how many people are going to be on our vessels. So actually us being part of that board helps us to make sure that these sort of dimensions are not forgotten because that's really where the integration comes from not just assuming it's about buses and trains but what are the idiosyncrasies of some of the other transport modes that may have slightly different demands later a requirement to know who you who's coming on who's certain coming. routes yes we do yeah. yes um richard i'm going to bring you back in if stuart if stuart has not answer, yeah, asked quick, your question uh, a quick question Last week, we found out that, you know, you go to London, it's all red buses. 
Last week, I found out that actually London Transport is no run, run by London Transport. It's run by various operators who bid, but they use their buses, the red, the brand. Problem in Scotland, in Lanarkshire, we've got several bus companies, right, who I can go from that bus to that bus to that bus with the, the same ticket. So how do we get the same that they've got in London, which is impressive, how do we get the same in Scotland? Because the one reason why we can't do, George, what you want to do, is we've got all these various companies who don't want to work with each other, who don't want to know each other, who think, oh, well, if he buys a ticket off that guy, I'm not getting my cut. George. Um, I, I think there is, within the bill, um, areas that cover that, and we would try initially encourage people to participate, because there are commercial benefits to doing it. Um, it will encourage, I think, if we, if we can get things right, it will encourage additional journeys to be made across the board. And if that uh, isn't enough incentive for any operator to increase ridership, then I, I question why they're in business. We're going to move on to the next question, which is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, there's a, a part of the bill that um, says that, uh, well, it proposes that Scottish ministers would require local authorities to establish their own smart ticketing schemes. But listening to the evidence that we've had this morning and it, the evidence that we've had in from local authorities, they're not keen because they say it's going to take away their autonomy and it's going to um, give them an additional administrative burden as well. Do we want local authorities to produce their own smart ticketing schemes or is it better to have something that's Scotland wide? Robert, do you want to come in on that? A, a number of journeys are, or the majority, are within local authority areas, so there are benefits to that. But there are an, also a, a number of journeys, depending on where you live, uh, across, <laughs> across boundary. So, right, from, from our, our evidence, what passengers want is a simple, convenient, flexible ticketing system that allows one journey across all modes and where there's not a artificial boundary from, say, North Lanarkshire, where I live, into South Lanarkshire, where you can go from Motherwell to Hamilton in one ticket and not have any... So a one-stop a one ticket, one -stop shop would be the best solution in the long term. George, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think, you know, powers have been there, I think, in the 2001 Act, that certain transport authorities could introduce. Um, to my knowledge, across Scotland, and I think that, with the exception of SPT, and I think it's ever happened. And I think that's been part of the difficulty in the past, that there hasn't been the motive and, 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 and inventiveness to, to come up with that type of ticket that Robert quite rightly says is, is, is being looked for by transport users. Um, and I think that's generally why two years ago we got to the point of frustration and said, well, we're going to push on and actually do something here and deliver it. Um, and yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it seems sensible to, to everybody that you build that up using the main urban areas and, and then expand it into the different modes. Um, Simon was right, you know, the, the, we get hung up on the plastic card, um, the range of technology, uh, we have to offer a, 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 the full range. And if you look at um, Glasgow, where we've got um, contactless, we've got smart ticketing, multi-operator smart ticketing, telephony. Um, as of last week, um, less than 30% of the journeys are no cash, 8% are off bus, and 50... I should have put my glasses on. 50, over 50%, 56% are now one of the smart modes. If you look at Aberdeen, um, Less than 26% of the journeys are cash. 8% um, of bus, they go to the shop and buy their ticket. 66% um, are in some form of smart technology. So it works. Uh, but they won't, we have to give that choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we, we could expect local authorities to deliver a range of choices. Do you want to? OK, um, so if not, this might be... A if not local authorities, who? Well, I think we have to work collectively. We, we, we need to involve local authorities and, and, and the new board that's been suggested. 
it's important we take their views on board. And it, it needs everybody that's there presently on the additional folk that, that need to join to be part of that and to agree in the nuances that will need, be needed between the different transport modes. And I think that's, that's the best approach to do it. And it will be done collectively in agreement. And, and we'll, we will get there, as we're demonstrating. Yeah. Yes, whereas I'm probably not best placed to comment about bus schemes, I think from a ferry perspective, uh, we operate, obviously, as you're aware, uh, through a contract with Transport Scotland, and that puts obligations on us to work towards smart ticketing. I've already made reference to the, to the system needs we have there. But certainly we see Transport Scotland as being a real enabler and, and something that really helps us get traction there as well. And that's something that I think is a good, good you know, uh, a good model by which it's not just the ferry company doing it in isolation, but it's working with rail and others. And, you know, that's where we see Transport Scotland providing some help to us. Jamie, do you want to come in on that? And, and uh, I think because you've got the next question on that. Yeah, I'm happy to continue this theme. It's all sort of rolling into one. Um, I, I just, I mean, I, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't share your optimism is my problem. I, I think that there are a number of things that this bill could have done. Um, there, and I think there are three areas where it, these, they need to work together to, to ensure some sort of national standard. There's a te on a technical level, there clearly needs to be uh, standardisation in the back end of all of this so that multi-operators and, and, uh, and multi-types of purchasing um, models can be used. And then there's obviously a regulatory environment around that that allows them to data share. But what, what's missing is the third bit, which is the commercial agreements. I think the idea that operators will just sit around the table and work it out amongst themselves is all very well and good. But we said that 14 years ago, and we've made no progress. There is, by default of the, the, the system in Scotland, going to be competitive uh, disagreement between operators in terms of the revenue share on a multi-journey ticket. So my question, first of all, is would whilst contact, contactless technology is welcome and convenient, does it really address uh, the problem of disaggregated ticketing and journey uh, ticketing? Does it offer real value for money if you're still paying for individual journeys, albeit in a more convenient method? Um, I, I think the front end and the technology platforms there, um, we have um, different back offices. Uh, we have Transport Scotland have a back office. They host the, the National Concessionary Travel Scheme on that. They also host some commercial arrangements for smaller operators across Scotland. Uh, the technology is near the issue here. Joining up um, is near that difficult. Um, people are using the different formats. Um, yeah, we'd like it to be wider geographically, and we'd, we would like to be further along the line uh, having partners uh, able to join us in, in, in widening the modal option as well. Um, we will get there. You know, in, in England, DFT spent something like £180 million on consultancy work to try and build the roof. Um, the, the overarching ticket that would do everything in England. And it failed miserably. They wasted £180 million. Quid. So we're trying to build up and, and build a structure that will support the roof, that will support that overarching ticket and aspiration that you, you're looking for. Um, we have only started this two years ago. But whose job is it to ensure the roof gets built? I mean, you're, if you say you're, the industry is itself setting the foundations by creating these common standards and common back offices, but if there's no, if there's no mandatory vision from the government to say you must work together to integrate, there's no regulatory environment in which that has to happen. Who's to say the roof will ever be built? If there's, you know, what benefit is in it for the, for the operators? Well, the, the, the encouragement comes through, as it did the Minister of Transport um, and the First Minister. Um, we hope that enthusiasm and commitment will flow through to the new Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure it will. We've had early discussions with him. Um, and, and the industry, uh, industries, I should say, are up for it. We're, you know, we are going to deliver it. My, my, my uh, beef about that, it will happen. Um, it has happened, it is happening. 
Um, it will expand morally and geographically, and it will move on in phases in terms of how we, the proposition that goes to the customer will move as well. It will have to, because our customers are telling us they like, they love it. Can we have more, please? And we'd be silly to ignore that. And can I just correct you as well that these things are set up as proper businesses. It's not a case of operators sitting in a room, a smoke-filled room, agreeing how they will carve up the price. We don't get to do that nowadays. That's um, history, and, and history that's gone, thankfully. It's done sensibly on a business case basis. There are directors that run the companies. So it, it's done sensibly. And it, you know, I wouldn't have to deviate if it, if it wasn't that. Can I just ask a question there? I mean, uh, one thing we heard from Transport for London that, you know, the, the thing people least look forward to of a morning was buying a ticket. So the easier you made it, the more likely they were to get onto the transport and it, it was likely to happen. So you've said it's going to happen. When's it going to happen by? I mean, can you give us a date of when it's going to happen by? Because I'm slightly taken by what Robert said earlier, that it's been talked about for a while. Um, do you have a date in mind when, when people will be able to use their smartphone or their card or their Oyster card across all of Scotland? It would just be nice to know that. Um, I wish I could. I'm not going to sit here and tell you lies. That wouldn't, that wouldn't do me any good. It wouldn't do your industry any good. Um, in some respects, I think the figures I've given you now was only one operator in two parts of Scotland. And that's, these things are, are rolling out as we speak. Um, I'd like to think... If we were back here in two years' time, there'd been a great deal of progress made. But there are franchise issues that need to be resolved. Um, I, I kinda, you know, I, I'm waiting in some respects for these guys to get the franchise issues resolved with Scottish Government, mm -hmm. and then we can push on. I'm going to hold my breath, and I'm going to pass you back to Jamie. Sorry. Well, I, I, I'm not going to mark a silly projection. <laughs> Jamie, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that last comment. I, I, I'm not going to mark a silly projection okay, yeah. on... Uh, before but I, I would on. hope that the next two years there will be real progress. I, 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 I hope too, but I, I'm pessimistic. Uh, Mr Sampson, you wanted to come in before I move on to my next question. Perhaps uh, with the Smart Ticket Advisory Board, you know, it advises Scottish ministers, maybe a way around about as the Scottish ministers to advise the advisory board to build me a roof. Can I ask the panel what their views are, are on uh, modal shift, uh, which is slightly off-field at the moment, but if we really want to encourage people out of their cars onto public transport, and we talk a lot about that in this committee and the benefits of getting people onto transport, which is for the benefit of the environment and the operators commercially themselves, the, the problem is the disparity at the moment across Scotland, and it's great there's good work happening in Glasgow and Aberdeen and in cities that's more likely to happen. Um, but it's really not happening, uh, as Colin Smith said, in our rural uh, areas. Uh, you know, the idea that even as Richard Lyle said, you, one operator doesn't uh, talk to another and tickets aren't able to be used on cross-operator services, even within the same mode. The idea that you can't buy a tram ticket that somehow connects to a rail service, even though they built a station, that you get off the tram and get onto the rail. I mean, the whole thing seems absolutely ludicrous. How can we expect people to get out of their cars and get onto public transport when we have such an antiquated, complex pricing structure that uh, really uh, has no standards across the country. We're looking at the transport bill. Should the transport bill be addressing that? Is it going to address it, or is it completely missing the trick? Who'd like to come in? Simon. I think one observation we, w we would make on that is we hear from our Islander customers and representation and the businesses and the MSPs from the islands that a lot of the, uh, the challenge that's happening in terms of tourism particularly is that vehicle traffic on our ferries is expanding and in a lot of times that's becoming a problem to the islanders because that's giving them difficulties in being able to go about their business. So what we see is in terms of modal shift is actually if we can encourage the leisure traffic the tourism traffic not to take their cars to the islands and actually then be able to use the local bus services then that's a huge benefit first it's a benefit for the bus services secondly it's a benefit for the leisure travelers because they will have that choice and thirdly it's a benefit for the islanders 
because actually there's capacity freed up on the ferries that they need to move their freight and their businesses around. So in terms of what this will offer, what we see is it's, it's as much as anything providing information to our customers and providing that ability to be able to say, yes, you can get on your train in Glasgow, you can take a ferry, a, 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 a train to Oban, you can go from Oban out to the islands, and once you're on the islands, you have a bus service and we give you that information there. So this is where we see maybe even going beyond a smart card, we see this as being mobile enabled, we see it an app enabled thing, which is not only selling the ticket for all of those different modes, but also providing the timetable information and the logistics information. And that to us is what a truly integrated solution starts looking like. But you can only do that if you're all working to the same ground rules of the same standards and the same technological approaches, which is why we think there's some good mileage here. Yes, we have some way to go in terms of our technology, as I've referenced earlier on, but that's certainly our vision of where we want to go, because we think there's massive wins for the business, for the environment, for the leisure traveller, and for the islanders. And that's got to be a win we should strive for. Richard, do you want to come in? Yeah, if you had that integration, you would actually save people money because I wouldn't need to pay to go on the bus, I wouldn't need to pay to go on the train, I wouldn't need to pay separately to go on the, uh, the boat. So, and, and I think in London, you only pay one, one maximum charge for the one day. You know, it doesn't matter where you're going. I think they've taken the zones off now, or maybe they're still there, but uh, I didn't feel it was expensive to go on what we went on uh, when my family and I were down in London. But, you know, but if I go on a bus, a train, or whatever, to go to, to Malaga or whatever, it cost me megabucks. So would a, a smart ticket sort that? <coughs> and then I'll come back to you, Simon. One of the main attractions or to get more people using smart technology is passengers expected to be cost effective, they expect it to be to make a saving, they expect it to be a reduced charge. That's one of the main attractors that get people using smart technology. There's a benefit in cost, there's a cost saving for me as a transport user. That is very much the forefront of passengers' mind when they want to use smart technology. There is a cost saving benefit for me, and that's got to be part of the, the system. I think, I think from our perspective, I can't comment on whether or not that would result in cheaper fares because our fares are pretty much set by Transport Scotland in terms of the ferry fares, so I can't comment on whether or not there will be any opportunity there. But what I think it would do is, is provide a cheaper option for people to travel because rather than them having to take the car with the expense of taking the car, they'll know that they can go as a foot passenger, which clearly is considerably cheaper. So that's where I think the benefit comes from. You're, you're helping people as I say, not take the more expensive option and actually giving them a flexible option that does make it cheaper for them. Sorry, if I, I, if, I mean, I think, uh, Richard, when we had our meeting and you were out at Transport for London, is one of the things that was made clear was that one of the reasons why people were happy to use transport and happy to use smart ticketing is because they could see on an app what was available to them and they could, they could plan their journey from their home and work out when they're going to leave. Do you see that's important as part of the smart ticketing uh, solution that, that allows people to plan it before, before they've washed their coffee cup up exactly how they're going to get to go to B? Yeah, George, you want to say? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's hugely important. One of the, the criticisms that uh, the previous minister uh, made of the industry was it was extremely difficult to find the, the, the fares that um, you'd pay to, to get on the bus. And we took it on board as best we could and harnessed the uh, Travel Line Scotland. So that if you were journey planning on Travel Line Scotland, um, uh, journey planning ads and uh, looking to a journey between two points, um, it now provides you with the fares information, the standard fare. And if you hover over that, it then offers up um, information on the range of discounted tickets that are available. We're working with Transport Scotland and Travel Line Scotland now to get to the next phase of that, so that once you've identified the journey, you've identified the fare, you click on the fare and you go through and load it onto your ticket. So, again, there's progress being made now, but it's hugely important that we, um, that we change that um, information provision. Uh, I, and, and the previous point on um, multi-operator tickets offering discount, if you look at one ticket in the east of Scotland, um, last week, if you were using two different bus services, you can buy one ticket now 
uh, that can get you a discount of between 30 and 50 per cent on the same journey. Uh, and in the East, uh, it is integrated with rail, uh, and there are options there for doing rail journeys as well. So these benefits will come. Trust. You wanted to ask a question on, and, and, and Robert and Simon, I'm going to come to you. Just see if Jamie can wrap something up that you could answer as well. It, it's interesting, you know, talking about mobile tickets. Uh, uh, you know, if I, I, like, I could leave this committee room and, and go on my phone and order a ticket to London, go to Waverley and go to London, and, and I could buy my ticket before I get to the station. But if I want to go to Glasgow, I have to go to the station, stand in a queue, a ticket machine, and buy a ticket. Um, so, the, is, is mobile ticketing really being used to its full benefit, given that uh, the majority of the population have access to a smartphone? And it, will it be done on an operator-by-operator operator basis, in the sense that improvements are welcome? But will that be an, an integrated or centralised uh, mobile ticketing system, based on what you've just said? We'll get to that. I think initially it will be individual products that will build, build that structure up. And, and then you can then start to do the smarter things about integrating modes and, and different ticketing options. Um, you know, technology is, uh, and we, we always have to keep in mind that everybody has got smart technology. Um, but I think it offers opportunities that we just didn't understand before. Um, and some of the things that we're seeing these days with the ticket machines, new ticket machines that operators are putting in, um, have the facilities to do a multitude of things. The technology is near the issue. It's getting around the table and agreeing if it needs to be done and then pushing on. Robert, very briefly, and then I'm going to move on to the next question. Simon, do you want to come in on that? In, in terms of uh, people being able to book over their coffee in the morning, uh, we think actually that's, that's a benefit uh, because I made reference to our bookable routes, 15 of our busiest routes, are very heavily ca capacity constrained. And, you know, people want the confidence to be able to book that ticket and be able to know they're going to get on that vessel. And this is why I, I referenced the ferry industry being slightly different, maybe to the sort of the bus industry. We do have that capacity. We do have to manage how many bookings we can take for each of our sailings. And that's where that integration between the mobile solution that Jamie was maybe just referencing and how it integrates into our live booking system, that's fundamental to us. It's a really important point, and that's where... You know, mobile ticketing to us is, is a great benefit. If people want to be able to see, can I sail tomorrow on that particular ferry, then we can tell them, yes, you can, and you can book it right now, and they've got confidence when they make that booking. Robert, do you want to say? Yeah, it just briefly. It's smart integrated ticketing basically goes hand in glove with smart integrated information for passengers. You know, they, they come together. There's some wonderful apps out there. I don't know if you saw down in London when you were there. City Mapper, for instance. You know, absolutely a, a wonderful app that can actually tell you what carriage of the train to go on to get a seat, where to get the best exit from the station, all in one app. You know, there are solutions out there, and something like City Mapper goes hand in hand with integrated ticketing, or a Scotland wide app that can do the same, the same thing, the functionality. You know, there are solutions out there, we just have to deliver them. Thank you, Robert. Uh, John, I think the next question is yours. Thanks, convener. I mean, I think we are kind of going over the same ground uh, from different angles, uh, but if I can have my shot as well. I mean, I've got this card, so this is the Saltair card, which, I, as I understand it, is national, although it is issued by Glasgow City Council and has their mark on it along with the subway. So if that's been going for a few years, and I can use, I've used this in Orkney with the committee, I have to say, and uh, why cannot we have something similar for other transport when people are paying? Is it the fact that it's paying it makes it so difficult? The card you've got is in the same platform as the smart cards that are being distributed to thousands of people across Scotland now. And the technology is there now for you to have a card. You know, if you look at the, the statistics that, 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 you, that your Transport Scotland team produce, the vast amount of majorities are local journeys. Um, but if you're um, when they go for a day trip to Dundee and we've got the technology lined up with a rail company, you can load your rail ticket onto that card. So that work top down, why on earth are we not doing the smart ticketing top down? Because it, it, the view was uh, reached that within the, work in the, the steering group that was being set up, that it was the best approach. 
the build up for the bottom, capitalising on the, the volume that you get um, through local journeys in the main urban areas, and then expand it geographically and morally. And, and that work is ongoing. From Fife and South Lanarkshire and North Ayrshire, that they are all got major reservations about this local building up approach. It appears that they would prefer a top down approach. Well, it, it, they, they've had since 2001 to hear a chat about that, and they've, they've, they've done away, you know. Okay, thank you. Robert, do you want to say anything just on that? Uh, just from the the passenger perspective, you know, we're talking about building top down or bottom up. From ever, wherever we are, the, the house is, is getting built. You know, what we need now is just uh, the will from the transport industry and the levers that government has to actually deliver. Uh, as, as I said earlier, it's been 14... It's been 14 Are industry enthusiastic about this card, which came top down? Some operators were, well, and I would imagine some weren't because of commercial concerns. So if we wait for everybody to agree, we could be waiting could, a very long time, couldn't we? But that's only one mode, remember? Well, it, it gives me a discount on the train, it gives me the subway. Is it, is it the concession card? Yes. John. No, that's me. Um, Sorry, I noticed everyone reaching into their pocket to pull out a plethora of cards. Uh, which, which, which makes it difficult for the official report to see all the different types of cards. I don't think any of them were pulling out money. I think it was just all travel cards. Stuart, briefly to you, and then I'm going to it, go to it, Peter. It's, it's just, I think, my colleague and I offline have worked out that one of the problems is we have got a standard, it's all Scott Rail senior citizens, um, but it appears we've established that the ScotRail app only works on Android phones and doesn't work on Apple ones. And that's a bit of a problem we've discovered. And, and, so, and, and absolutely, I can tell you that not, not all of the routes on ScotRail are, are smart ticketed either, because if, uh, you, if you start at Keith in the morning, you have to go and get your ticket from no, the machine. No, no. So there, there are huge... I've got a Keith ticket on this. Well, huge <laughs> problems, I would say. Uh, well, Peter, can we just go on to you then, please? Let's, let's move on a bit. I, I mean, we've, we've all been speaking about increasingly using new technology, which is grand. Electronic payments, contactless payments, all that stuff. But we've got to recognise, and it has been mentioned before, that not everyone has access to that technology, you know, mostly, but not exclusively, probably elderly folk and the very young. So how do we ensure that as we move forward with new technology that these passengers aren't left behind? What are we going to give to them in the future? Robert, I'd like to bring you in to start with on that, if I may. It's critically important. We all, we all like to get carried away sometimes with mobility as a service and uh, various technology advances. But a lot, of, a lot of users out there, consumers, will still want to use cash, still want to talk to someone for reassurance at a booking office. Uh, so that's got to be part of part of any ticketing solution in the mix. That you can't all. You, it's not all got to be smart enabled. There's got to be room for passengers. Who want to pay by traditional methods? Who want the reassurance from a, from a, from the co from the company? Who want a paper-based ticket? You no, know, as a solution for a lot of people, but not for everyone. So that's got to be in the mix of any transport bill and any policy and any advisory board going forward. That not everyone will want to use smart, and we've got to remember that not everyone can afford it. Yeah. And cash on CalMac. We still see cash as being a very a valid form of payment and we see no reason to move away from that. I think, as I referenced earlier, you know, we, we operate in some very challenging environments in some respects and in some areas where we have no, no staff, no buildings, are very simple slipways. So actually, it's our vessel staff, our people on our, our staff on our vessels, who we're giving the capability to be able to take cash, to be able to use contactless. And we want to give as much choice as we can to our customers. And again, particularly you know, I referenced the, the tourism uh, market earlier on. You know, a lot of people will be coming to Scotland and they won't know what a smart card is, a Scottish smart card. You know, they, they, they will be expecting to pay cash. 
And that's fine. Why would we say no to that? So, you know, everything that we see in terms of how our systems work, you know, we've got ticket offices in many of our ports. They provide, those staff provide huge value and comfort to our customers, and they offer those choices as to how they want to pay. And that's absolutely something we are, we intend and will we'll continue to offer. George, just to round that off, cash on buses as well? Do you think that's... Yeah, and I've already said that, that, that cash will need to remain. I think there are uh, opportunities um, for things like children, rather than having cash, they can get a thing in their school bag now that, that speaks to the ticket machine and it works seamlessly. So there are, are lots of options, but cash will need to remain. Peter. Just, just to follow up on that, is there any way that, you know, going down the cash route, is there any way that somebody paying cash could then bundle up a number of journeys with that one cash payment, or is that something that none of you could, could envision happening? Robert. Yeah, it happens just now in, uh, with Carney tickets and flexi passes that you can, with cash, you can buy 15 journeys and get 20 journeys. Basically, there are products out there mm. that benefit cash users as well, where you have some <laughs> saving if you, if you want to buy a flexible pass, but as a, as a higher cash payment, obviously, than a single ticket. But there are still benefits out there for people who use cash. Mm. Okay. Um, Simon, and then I'm going to bring in the Deputy Commissioner again. Simon. Just a very brief one on that one. We actually do offer that service so you can buy a combined rail and, and ferry ticket already. So, yeah. Yeah, not, not on many routes, and, you know, that's the opportunity we see. Mm. But there are some limited numbers of routes where that, that service is available, and you can pay however you wish. OK. Maureen, you, you want to come in? Yeah, um, with um, contactless or an Oyster card or, or whatever... Um, one of the problems, I think, is confidence that you're getting the best fare possible. I mean, there is a multitude of fares on any mode of transport, often, I think, designed to confuse. And even you get quoted different pl prices for the same journey on different platforms. And I don't mean rail platforms. I mean, whatever you're, gonna, you're trying to, to book it on. I wonder how you can guarantee... In Transport for London, they can absolutely guarantee that you're getting the best fare possible. I wonder if there's a way that fares could be streamlined that are more open and transparent and, you know, maybe you have an off-peak fare. I see the point of that. Um, but, you know, we don't... I don't think people have the confidence at the moment that you're, you're getting the best fare possible. And even on concessionary cards, I mean, why can't a concessionary card... You, you have a, a ScotRail concessionary card, a bus concessionary card. That's not even streamlined, I don't think. George, uh, I'm going to let you come in. And, and Well, Robert, if anyone wants to come in, all I'd say is I've got two more questions, so, so short answers would be good. So, George, if you want to yeah, head off. Well, I think technology and the form that you've mentioned in London um, is in, inevitably going to come to Scotland um, as part of, if nothing else, um, contactless because it allows the technology to then drive the maximum fare that you would pay in a day if you make X journeys, and that's it. Um, so it will come. Robert, on that point. Users want security with their smart technology, how their personal data is secured, and how their contactless information, the bank account, etc., is secure. And it's also got to be transparent. And to attract people to smart technology, the value for money in it, how it's better than paper-based tickets for convenience sake and what the savings are making. Now, those are in the seven recommendations we've, we've made to the committee and we've written evidence about what users basically need to attract them to smart technology. Um, Gail. Just really quickly, thanks, Convener. We're sitting here at a really high level talking about what users want and what users need and we're talking about an advisory board and we're talking about local authorities but what consultation has happened is happening or should happen with the actual users of these services to ask them exactly what they do want Robert over the last uh, four or five years if you check there's about 10 15 reports on our website bus rail uh, tram as well what passengers want to see from smart technology, what their seven key criteria are, and it's value for money, convenience, simplicity, security, flexible, tailored and leading edge. It's all been evidence-based on the users of the system and what they want to actually see in delivering smart technology. And has that been Scotland-wide? It's included Scotland's GB-wide. Okay. 
Does anyone else want to add anything to that? George. I'd, I'd just say that um, we as an organisation and the operators that we have in our membership use the, the reports that, that, that Transport Focus produced to, to learn um, uh, customers' views on a range of different things. In addition to that, um, Bus Users Scotland also holds surgeries in different parts of Scotland for the operators uh, and, and bus users meet with the general public that use uh, bus services. So there's a number of forums that run as well in different parts of Scotland for the customer comes along and tells the operators and the local authority the areas of issue and, and for the thing that need, needs to be improved. And if you're not listening to that, then you, you would suffer. Very quick final question, if I may. I mean, it appears that everyone's in favour of smart ticketing and getting it uh, out there as quickly as possible. Is there one change you would make to the bill to make sure that that happens sooner rather than later, George? Um, Money is always helpful, <laughs> but it, 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 you know, so far it's been done uh, to quote uh, quicker and less costly to the Scottish government than has been uh, had been expected. So we, we, we're going to keep working and uh, deliver things over the next few years as quickly as we can. Simon. I think the bill, as it stands, we're, we're very supportive of. In terms of what we need to really drive that forward from a uh, CalMAC's perspective is the help that I alluded to earlier on, which is we need Transport Scotland to step up and help us move forward with our new ticketing platform. That's our big enabler, and that's the thing that will really bring the ferry industry into this whole forum, and we are massively keen to do that. Robert. Yeah, as the bill stands... I think the remit of the advisory board should be to deliver on Scotland's transport future 2004, where one ticket will get you anywhere. Uh, a, a, a simple answer. And on that note, maybe it's an appropriate time to thank you all for get the evidence that you've given us uh, this morning. And I'm now going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow a witness changeover. Thank you very much.
Good morning again for those that are joining us now. We're now going to move on to the second panel, and this is uh, on the Transport Scotland Bill, where we'll take evidence relating to proposals relating to bus services. And George Mayer, Director of Scotland Confederation of Passenger Transport, has stayed in his seat. Gavin Booth, the Director of uh, Scotland Bus Users uh, Scotland. Emma Cooper, Chief Executive of Scottish Rural Action. Uh, Chris Day, Policy Advisor to Transform Scotland. And Professor David Gray, Professor of Transport Policy at Robert Gordon University. Um, thank you for all attending this morning. And the first question this morning is going to be from John Finney. John. Thank you. It's been a good morning, panel. Uh, I, I, it's widely acknowledged there's been a dramatic loss of um, bus patronage. Um, and uh, I know Mr Mayor will be familiar with what I'm going to refer to because it was his organisation that commissioned research. And that research said that this was largely linked to increased car ownership, longer journey times. And these two, in my view, will be inextricably linked and fear increases exceeding um, the, the rate at which motoring costs increase. Now, we have a lot of evidence on, on this uh, particular aspect of the bill, and, and it has been referred to as a, a missed opportunity. I wonder um, if the panel would comment on whether the bus-related proposals in the bill tackle the underlying clock, um, causes of the long-term decline in bus patronage, please. So the secret is, is to try and catch my eye, and I will definitely bring you in. And if I can't see anyone looking at me, I'll, I'll, I'll pick the one who, who looks least willing to answer it. So if you want to come in, here's your chance. David, I think you want to go first, and followed by Chris. Uh, no, is the short answer. Um, I think the, the fundamental issues facing the bus industry are, um, in urban areas, uh, go back to the mid-1980s when we abolished um, regional councils, and in rural areas, back to at least the early 1960s. Um, because there are fundamental structural issues in rural areas. But in terms of the fundamental problems are, uh, can be traced back to the abolition of regional councils. Uh, we have too many small local authorities who tend to be competing for housing, for retail uh, and, and for jobs. Um, and that, and they're quite often overlapping sensible journey to work areas. And the, the, the kind of long term social change that results as that is people living uh, further away from where they work, take recreation, socialise, uh, etc. And that um, and that kind of societal change is basically uh, is dri driving down um, bus use. Uh, and so, yeah, I think the, the bill tackles the symptoms, but it, it's planning and probably local authority um, changes that need to would actually tackled underlying disease. Chris, do you want to come in on that? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we, we did use the phrase of missed opportunity, I think, in, in our written evidence. So I would certainly endorse that sentiment. And uh, our concern is that it doesn't actually address the underlying issues, which I think you've probably already touched on. Um, what, what I think it's important not to lose sight of is, in fact, the, fit, the, the, the picture is very patchy. There has been a long-term decline generally, which appears to have perhaps levelled off slightly on a Scotland-wide basis. If you look at the graphs, I think, in the SPICE briefing, which I um, and certainly re uh, replicated it in our evidence. But from Transform Scotland's point of view, um, bus patronage is not as high as we would aspire to as, a, as an organisation that's committed to sust sustainable transport. The patchiness is that, again, if you look at the SPICE evidence, it shows that the decline is different in different parts of Scotland. And the decline is perhaps uh, less pronounced in Inverness, for example, in southeast Scotland uh, than it certainly is in Glasgow and the, the old Strathclyde area, where it appears to be particularly pronounced. Um, so I don't want to kind of suggest that's a... A, a reason for complacency in respect to the other other parts of Scotland, but we need to be looking at how you increase bus patronage. And I think as has been touched on in urban areas, uh, it's about congestion, it's about parking. I think perhaps in, in rural areas, and I'm sure Emma will, will have something to say about this, the issues are quite different. And I think perhaps in rural areas, you need to look at 
different ways of delivering bus services uh, rather than having a 47 seat um, vehicle trundling along uh, a country road once every second day, you need to look at alternative ways of providing a service to meet their aspirations. So there are differences in different, different parts of Scotland. Emma, it looks like Chris has introduced you, so do you want to come in on that, and then I'll bring Gavin in. Yeah, thanks, thanks Chris. <laughs> um, so, no, we, we don't think that the Transport Scotland Bill will tackle the underlying cause of the decline in bus services, unfortunately. To, to do that, there would need to be a significant increase in service provision in rural areas, absolutely. Reduced journey times, more seamless journeys, connecting different modes of transport much better and more effectively than we do now. You need to include fare reductions in that uh, and really look at the whole kind of transport picture in, in Scotland and, and think about how, how all these things go together. So at the moment, the bill for us isn't, isn't really tackling that, no. You, you wanted to come in with a... Professor, um, I was a councillor. <laughs> I never liked Strathclyde Regional Council in my life. Um, I was a district councillor and then became a North Lancashire councillor. Uh, so I don't agree with the fact that uh, regional councils were the cause. Were the, was the cause not deregulation? Because you can't get a bus. You can't find a bus. And that's why people are not going on buses, because they're not regular. They uh, don't come along when you want them. And basically, that's the reason why this bill has to tackle that cause. David. I wouldn't say that regional councils are perfect, but there was better coordination of economic development, housing, transport and retail. It was better than we have now. Yes, there was. Um, at the moment, we have, we have had about three decades of decentralisation, which has been developer-led primarily in many areas, uh, and transport services and planning has had to follow rather than lead in many cases. Stuart, you had a supplementary. It's a tiny wee thing. I wonder if uh, the buses uniquely make it difficult for people to get on buses compared to other transport. I remember years ago, uh, I got on a bus and I found I didn't have the change, and, the, and therefore my bus journey cost me more than it should have done because I had no idea what the fare was, and I just didn't have the change. And it kept me off the buses for 20 years. And I know plenty of other people in the same. Now, should the bill therefore ban uh, fixed, fixed cash only? Uh, but unfortunately, I think that's probably ultra various for this parliament. Ga Gavin, do you want to comment on that or anyth anything um, said earlier? Uh, yes, I mean, I think that that is sort of in a way tied up with what the previous session was talking about, sort of integrated fares and so on. That might well address some of these uh, problems about exact fare systems. Um, I, I take the view that things I, I perhaps slightly different from the others. I, I've been around this industry for more than 50 years in the days before deregulation and the days since deregulation. And... Uh, I worked in the industry at the time of deregulation and I, I have seen over the past 30 years since deregulation that the bus industry, I think, is actually performing much better for the passenger. And I think in the pre-deregulation days, the passenger was sort of fairly <coughs> near the bottom of the heap. I worked for the bus company, that, that, the bus group, uh, that uh, was providing millions of journeys throughout Scotland every day. Uh, and it was all about performance, it was all about um, production rather than about the passenger, the end user. So I look around now with the benefit, hopefully, of that experience, and I see bus companies that are commercially motivated, that understand the passenger much better than they did, that understand that uh, marketing can reach the passenger, that they understand the market, and they can sell products to the market. Of course, it's not perfect, but I, I believe we are much further on than even the, the figures. I see the figures. I know the, the reasons for the figures. Some of them, I, I suspect the bill can't address. Things like home working, things like internet shopping that has affected bus passenger numbers hugely. People are not traveling because they are working on electronic machines at, at home. Uh, so I, I think I would see the, the part of the bill that, that can address a lot of this are the bus service improvement partnerships. I'm a great believer in partnerships. I think partnerships between local authorities and uh, bus companies 
can achieve a great deal. Local authorities can provide the track. And one of the problems we've seen, uh, uh, you, I think uh, uh, Chris mentioned this, the, the difference in passenger loss over the country is, is marked. It's fairly flat in many parts, but it is, it is, the reduction is fairly frightening in the west of Scotland and uh, the southwest of Scotland. And a lot of that is to do with access to the roads. It's to do with parking, it's to do with control, it's to do with providing the track. I was at a conference the last two days, uh, Confederation of Passenger Transport Conference, and the, the whole question of roads like the M8 into Glasgow, bus operators using the M8 are finding themselves held back by the, the sheer amount of traffic that there is on that road. If buses were given a track, were given bus priorities, could get their passengers through much more quickly, that I think would persuade a lot of people to leave their cars, perhaps leave their cars um, at park and ride sites and travel into the city centre by bus. So I think that the, the bill can uh, address some of these problems through encouraging partnerships between local authorities and bus companies. George, do you, do you want to have a chance at that one? Um, I, I think just acknowledge the, the, there are issues around um, operator involvement and things like planning and uh, hosting schemes and various other. The best example of that is probably the new, the new hospital, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow, that was almost ready to open and somebody said, hold on, we've now got any buses come to the front door. Um, these kind of things should not be allowed to happen. And one would hope that if, if nothing else, through the bus service improvement partnerships that's been proposed, that dialogue with local authorities wouldn't be restricted to only dealing with the public transport element of the council. It would need to broaden out and involve people that, uh, for planning so that you're getting a bigger picture, you're understanding the developments and quite often being able to say to them, if you put that 500 houses in that location, you ain't going to get a bus service because it's not big enough to support it. And that, that, that's a big part of the rural um, issue. Um, Mr. Frenet mentioned the report. Um, the report outlined a whole range of different things, some of which Gavin touched on. Um, yes, fears are in there, I, I acknowledge that, um, but equally, quality improvements. We've actually seen from these two million plus additional journeys being generated. 75% of the patronage loss was due to things that operators have very little control or no control over. And I think I've got the hope that that element can be picked up through partnership working. Come back on that. Thanks very much. I, I, I'm quite astonished with the example given of the hospital there. Um, as someone who was on a planning committee, a traffic impact assessment used to be a key element of anything in the regard that it should have to public transport. So that's very disappointing, but uh, not for this committee. I, I wonder in the pecking order of these things I said, Mr Mayor, so the, the um, increase in car ownership and journey times, uh, and it's something that Mr Booth touched on there. People don't, they probably sooner sit in a queue in their own vehicle rather than someone else's vehicle would tend to be the issue. Do you feel this, this bill is the vehicle, excuse the pun, to, 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 to progress some of these issues about dedicated lanes, about traffic priority with the signals and the, the operation? I don't understand the technicalities, but that you can trigger the signals by approach of a, a, a bus. I think that it's <clears> one of the areas that we have a concern on uh, in, in the partnership. You know, we, we endorse the partnership work, and I you know, absolutely confirm that. The one thing that worries me a wee bit, and I've worked in the industry for probably more years than I can count, actually, but never mind, 40-plus years, um, and there was always that seed of doubt that you were sat trying to work in partnership, um, but things would, wouldn't happen. Um, and even in partnership, sometimes it didn't happen. So for me, something that maybe needs to be put in there. As an operator, you sign up to operate buses, you commit to uh, delivering services, you, you get regulated by the traffic commissioner, and if you fail in these areas, um, Ms. Aitken will call you into public inquiry and she will deal with you, uh, and quite severely at times as well. Um, we didn't see the same balance. You know, partnership to me is that you um, you meet, you discuss things, you meet, minds meet, and you come up with a plan. And if either side commits to delivering things, then you should get on and deliver it. But 
whilst the operator, if he fails to deliver, um, can be pulled up, have his licence removed, there's not the same call on the local authority to say, why did you not deliver that piece of um, um, bus priority measure or better infrastructure or whatever? So there's something there that needs to be needs to be thought through. But by far the biggest impact on bus journeys is congestion, um, is car ownership, and things like government policy, for we've had no change to fuel duty for, um, is it nine years now? Uh, just think how many additional car journeys have been, have been born on the back of that. Again, not within the gift of... Uh, I know, this, but this you'd expect me to mark these yes, kind yes, of yes, and, yes, indeed. Um, and, and so, if I may, um, and, you know, as a, a relative aware that I was going to be doing this who waited 25 minutes for a bus that didn't turn up recently, you know, you can understand the frustrations. Do you think it's, it's, it's disproportionate? Because my experience, certainly, of the... It's not a great use of bus. I use the train a lot. Um, it's quite positive. I mean, I can go and find, uh, particularly in Edinburgh, but, um, but also in the Inverness area. But the frustration is that, of course, if you have transport across towns and towns are conge congested, then speaking to bus companies, that's where the frustration lies, because they can't commit to it. John, Chris, Chris is quite keen to come in on the previous one, and then I'll, I'll try and take some others if I may. Chris, do you want to come in on that? It, it, it perhaps answers it, your second question as well. I think one of the um, issues with the bill is that it or perhaps with the whole debate about the future of buses in, in Scotland, is that there's uh, a, a lot of attention is focused on operators. Not a lot of, if any, attention is focused on the infrastructure. Now, you will understand, if I use the, the rail analogy, that half of the business is the trains and the services that provide, and half of it's the stuff that they run on. And in our view, over the last... Um, 15 years, perhaps. Um, councils have for, or lo tra local transport authorities have for a number of reasons, perhaps done very little in terms of providing the infrastructure that any operator um, will need to run on. Edinburgh used to be held up as a kind of um, a, a, a gold standard in the uh, late 90s, the, the early 20s, of, of making deliberate, clear-cut political decisions to promote bus use by devoting highway space to buses. Now, that's kind of um, been taken a bit of a backseat over the last five, ten years. Uh, perhaps that's coming full circle. But I, I would probably say... Um, that very few councils really in recent years have been spending as much time and resource as we would like to see them doing on the infrastructure. And again, in our written evidence, I think we, we included a graph, which is not, we're not saying is, is proof, uh, but there is a clear correlation in Edinburgh between the expansion of bus lanes and bus priorities and the growth of patronage on Lothian buses. Lothian buses was, it was losing passengers until the late 90s, and in the late 90s, you began to see bus lanes being extended in Edinburgh. And that's when it, Lothian began to see massive growth. So that's a critical part of it, as, as well as the operations, and we need to see that addressed in the bill. Thank you. Uh, Maureen, your, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, convener, in the interest of <coughs> openness and transparency, I should probably say that I've known George Mayer since I was a regional councillor in the mid-90s, um, when it's about the time, I think, that George and Moore and Lockhead were setting up the first bus. Um, so, in relation to my question, which is kind of <laughs> linked to that, um, uh, the panel will know that uh, the... There, the bill seeks to amend the Transport Act 1995 to allow local authorities or companies formed by local authorities or a regional transport partnership um, to set up, uh, to provide local bus services. So, my question would be, should a local authority or regional transport partnership-owned bus companies be able to provide both commercial 
and supported services, or are you content with the limitations on the type of service they can provide that's currently set out in the bill? David. Um, I, I tend to look at it from a slightly different view, that, and with my rural hat on, uh, I think the key metric is pounds per passenger journey, and anything that can uh, increase the flexibility and, and, and kind of ability of um, local authorities to reduce that uh, and make services cost less is welcome. Um, so yes, if it leads to that. But we also, I mean, already, for example, Murray Council run Murray Dial Bus, and I think there's a bus service in the Corla that is also kind of operated by the council as well. So there are small scale examples of that happening where the council have thought, well, we need to do something. So anything that say, increases flexibility and uh, council's ability to reduce costs is, is, is welcome by me. How would you envisage uh, councils managing to reduce the cost? Um, well, by being able to do it a lot cheaper than tendering, tender prices. Um, and, and a number of areas and a number of routes the council will tender uh, for a service that they support and a bus company might not particularly be bothered about tendering for it particularly they, they probably make all their bread and butter off school services so they'll they'll tender for it just to make a little extra money and they'll go in with a high tender knowing that it's no 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 skin off their nose if you don't get it so the tender costs will be uh, probably too high um, in reality and the council will be able to undercut that by doing it themselves Basically, sort of picking up what David's saying, yes, I think local authorities obviously have to look after their own uh, finances, and if bus operators are bidding too high to operate uh, supported services, then if the local authority feels they can do this, then from the passenger point of view, the important thing is that the, these services should continue. Um, who is providing the service is probably of less important, or who's financing the service is less important to the passenger than the fact that there is a, a, a service. So I think you know we're relaxed about uh, that side of things uh, as long as, at the end of the day, it, it guarantees a service for uh, for our passengers. Mm. Maureen, do you want? Well, I suppose um, before any other members of the panel want to come in to answer that, it is um, I mean. Uh, Professor Gray, in terms of um, what you've just said, are you taking into, the into account the fact that there will be, I would assume, poten uh, potential really quite substantial start-up costs for a local authority or whoever to, to start a bus company? Yeah, I, I, that, yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that it, it's necessarily the first choice option, but I mean, we're... we're Councils are having to withdraw a number of services because they can't afford it or because tender costs are going up. It, it seems to be a, a sense, at least explore it as a sensible way forward that can reduce the cost to the council of providing services. I mean, anything as I say that increases flexibility and the ability to provide services at a reasonable cost, I think, should be explored. Um, who, sorry, you, you've got to help me just a wee bit uh, to see if I can ca you catch my eye if you want to come in. Mm -hmm. it saves me having to nominate somebody. George. Yeah. Um, I think the bill tries to find a reasonable balance in that um, if, if the, the local authority feels that they, that they are um, they're getting the right range of offers from the tenderers, uh, that they, they, they can take things into their own hand. Some of, some of the local authorities have had that powers for many years and, and have, have never really used them. Um, but I think, like some of the others, that to give powers is probably quite simple, um, but to actually deliver it on the ground, uh, think through the, the cost uh, set up, the cost of investing in fleet. Um, I'm assuming that if you were to go down that road, you would need the um, local authority to, to do it in a level playing field in terms of operator licensing, driver training, driver CBC, um, so it's quite often easy to say, yeah, it wouldn't be good, we're just getting the powers to do that job, but actually delivering it on the ground every day. Um, and at a time when they are already struggling financially to the extent that in some areas they've totally 
removed support for bus services generally. And in others, they're, they're investing in a pittance as a budget that they get handed down for Transport Scotland, eh, for Scottish Government, sorry. So huge, huge risk um, to go down the path of saying, well, let's just turn the clock back, give them our licence and, and, and they'll get on and, and deliver it. Well, it might, but I think there's a big risk that it wouldn't work. Clear about um, convener from, from the panel is that at the moment the bill would only allow a local authority to run a bus service under very restricted circumstances. In other words, to meet what it's classed, and I don't know what it means, but it says in the bill, unmet need. The bill as it stands at the moment will not allow a local authority to run a bus service, either at arm's length or as a local council service, effectively in competition to the private sector for commercial as well as uh, so-called non-commercial buses. Uh, and I suppose the question is, do the panel believe that that very restricted um, circumstance should be con allowed to continue in the bill or should we remove that and allow local authorities to set up uh, bus companies, which is what local authorities, frankly, are asking for the power to do to run any service they wish. And I, I, I take on board that last two weeks ago we had evidence from Gordon Mackay of the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland that comes back to the point Mr Mayor said, who basically said that the number of local authorities who would set up bus companies based on what's contained within the bill with that restriction will be somewhere between nil and not very many because it is so restricted. Because frankly, why would you take the risk to only run services that make a loss? And the question is, should that restriction be lifted and councils be allowed to run services right across the board? Emma, do you want to mention that from a rural perspective or would you? Yeah, I mean, firstly, uh, currently, as the bill stands, we don't think it's going to have a significant impact on the on, on an increase in services. It's not going to give us a, a great number of, of better or, or more bus services in rural areas. The other side of it, as you've just laid it out, is a much more difficult question. You know, we, we don't want to put um, small businesses out of out of business. You know, that that's not what anyone wants to do. Having said that, buses are a are a lifeline service. They're an essential service. They get people to job. They they're, they're jobs. They get people to work. They get our tourists around our country, and it's a vital service. So. It has to be provided, and if the current uh, provision isn't working for communities, and in rural areas it's not working for communities, then we have to look at alternative methods. So it would be really interesting to see a more detailed study on what the implications of that approach might be. Chris, do you want to come in on that? Well, as, 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 uh, as your question went on, I thought you were probably answering it yourself. Um, I don't think anyone would dispute the point about um, if there's no commercial operator prepared to... Um, operator service that giving local authorities the powers to do that directly, you know, fine. Um, I would hazard a guess that many, if not most, uh, councils already have transport departments. They run things like the bin lorries, they run things like the road maintenance. So there's a core of an organisation there that you could see how it will, it, it, it will expand this. There's a different difference in terms of scale, however. And a number of local authorities do provide um, non-commercial services uh, where, um, where, where no operator is, pre is prepared to tender for tender on the, under the existing rules. I think the in, more interesting point about your question, though, is the one about should those local authorities be enabled to uh, operate commercial routes as well and um, that's a question I think we would probably leave open I mean it's interesting that the Scottish Government is considering allowing the um, a private uh, sorry a public sector uh, operator to bid for the next Scott Rail franchise along with presumably private operators is that a model that could be applied in the um, in, in, in the bus sector as well. I think what's going to be the critical issue, though, is if you are a council leader or a council chief executive and you're being asked the question, why does your council not operate, not provide commercial bus services in competition with this operator in our area who's failing, you need to carefully consider the financial implications of doing so Bus, bus wars are expensive to win. They're very expensive to lose. So, like Emma, how much 
how many councils would actually uh, wish to venture into that area as things stand at the moment? I've got my doubts. OK, I'm going to briefly bring in David, and then I'm afraid we're going to have it, to move was, on to the next question. It was just a final point, again, with my kind of rural island hat on, is that, I mean, community transport already run bus services not in competition with, with commercial services on, on certain routes in certain places. Uh, if, if it could help drive down costs, is there any reason why councils couldn't do the same on a small scale if there's some uh, um, economies of scale that could be made on a, on a micro scale? I don't see any reason why we shouldn't explore it. And I, I, anything that drives down costs for local authorities and the government should be a good thing and should be explored. OK, we're going to have to move on to the next question, I'm afraid, which is John. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, we currently have bus quality partnerships and the proposal is to have bus service improvement partnerships. Now, could any of you define for me what the difference is and do you think it's a step in the right direction or a step in the wrong direction? Sorted that out straight away, Gavin. Do you want to come in on that, or you shook your head? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I'm very much in favour of, of partnerships. I'm not quite sure what the, the, the difference would be, but certainly we know that uh, the, the partnerships that were, the, the quality partnerships that were proposed, uh, none of them has ever been sort of taken up. Uh, so we're sort of starting from uh, a base of sort of thinking, well, we must make it perhaps easier for, for bus companies to, to want to be part of a partnership and make it easier for local authorities to be part of a partnership. I am um, you know, a great believer in partnerships. I believe passengers benefit all round from partnerships, particularly when uh, the bus companies are, are upping their game to, to match any investment by the local authority in infrastructure, in, in bus lanes and so on. So, I'm voluntary partnerships up till now, but not statutory not ones, statutory. because that's, that's been easier to get into, yes. No, sorry, sorry there are statutory. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, sorry. everyone else has looked the other way when, when we got to this question. Um, I, I think that the Bus Service Improvement Partnership tries to simplify some of the barriers or challenges or real or perceived barriers that, that, that were in there in the previous legislation. Um, Across Scotland, we've, we've had a number of voluntary partnerships. I think the, the longest surviving one is the, the one in the northeast of Scotland, the Quality Partnership for Public Transport, which is the Aberdeen City and Shire. It came into being in 1998, and over the years, they've, they've built some good projects into that and are, have um, just relaunched it uh, this year as um, Bus Partnership Alliance. Um, we had statutory quality partnerships in the west of Scotland. Um, the most recent one was the Fastlink uh, uh, SPT um, statutory quality partnership uh, for, for the Fastlink corridor for the Glasgow city centre to the, the new hospital. And that, that statutory quality partnership was probably, in terms of the operational requirements placed on the operators for uh, vehicles on the and the spec of the vehicle and the operational requirements is probably one of the toughest for operators to meet anywhere in the country. Um, partnership works. It, it can work. Some of the barriers to partnership previously has been the, the concern on the local authorities' part about funding, uh, funding on an ongoing basis. So if you were looking at some big projects that might need cash over multi years, no guarantee that that would happen. Um, and generally some resistance to, to, to getting into to, to work on partnership. But it, but it, partnership as being better than the previous quality I, partnership? I think it's simplifying a number of the areas that were in the previous legislation. Right. So simplifying it, that would be the main difference, yes. right? That's helpful. John, before you go on, yes. Emma's quite keen to come in. Yep. Just to say, really, you, you seem to be struggling with the same question that, that I am, which is what difference is this actually going to make to people on the ground? And that, that's quite hard to, to see at the moment. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> there's, there's people nodding. Chris is nodding. Gavin seems to be nodding. Um, so, so right, well, can I just run into the next one then, which is linked, which is that um, there could be a veto on an improvement partnership if uh, sufficient operators were opposed to it. Now, 
well, I don't think we know, or do you know, what sufficient means? And and is, have you any thinking around that? I mean, I assume it's because you one other operators wouldn't want a kind of monopoly developing for one operator. George, looks like you're, you're going to go on that I, one. I think it's about trying to get that balance that you... When you go into this, it's a negotiation. It's, um, it's the local authority or, or, or more, one or more, if it's um, cross-boundary. And you're trying to get um, a negotiation going that, that gets to a point that you have a meeting of minds about the aspiration of that area and how you can improve the bus product across the board. Um, I think it's right that somewhere in there, either party can say, well, hold on a minute, we don't feel either we're getting enough, uh, the council to the operator, or the operator to the council, you've, you're asking too much, but you're not offering us enough. It's a negotiation. And some way in there, if, you, if we get the point far, the balance is not right, and it's tipping one direction, somebody, uh, either side should be able to say, well, hold on a wee minute, we're not quite there. Um, one operator couldn't stop it. It would need to be supported by the rest of the operators to say, well, that's going to impact us all. We're not seeing the benefit coming through for you that we anticipate for, for that kind of arrangement. So it, it, it just, it, it's just business. You, know, you, 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 you have to have a checks and balances position. So do you think it gets the balance right? Because I think some of the councils felt that it was giving too much power to the bus operator. But, I mean, my experience is in the east end of Glasgow, there's a real monopoly in buses. It's only one company that's operating. So it would have to be the council or SPT and that bus operator. Or if they didn't agree, it wouldn't happen, basically. Um, the, George, lead off on that, and then David wants yeah, to come in on that. Yeah, the, the partnerships that I've been involved in across Scotland uh, are open to all operators. Some operators decide um, need to participate, um, but the invitation's there. And, and uh, you know, in, our, in the Aberdeen one, we have um, small operators that come in for the outline area to be, to be part of that, that partnership. So the, the offer's there. You kind of force people, um, but... Um, if the partnership goes ahead and there are facilities provided that people are, the operators are um, either supporting through financial contribution or improvements to the, to the fleet, then the operators that didn't participate in the quality partnership scheme didn't get the benefit. OK, David, do you want to come in? I've, I, I'm answering this one with my high trans hat on, um, and so I've got three hats on today. Um, I'll go back slightly to the, the previous point, is, is that um, from the high trans perspective, uh, I think a lot of the provisions in the bill with regard to things like um, extending parking charge and things like that are, are to be welcome, but I think the view from the partnership was that the absence of those things weren't necessarily a factor in why some quality partnerships, voluntary quality partnerships, petered out. It was more the squeeze on uh, revenue and capital due to austerity, and, and that's kind of... Um, I guess partnerships will only succeed if there's revenue and capital funding available to, the, to deliver the local authority side of things on the ground. And that's, that's the key issue. You can, the bill can change what provisions are, are, are available to local authorities, but if you don't have the capital and revenue funding to deliver it uh, and sustain it, then the partnerships will fail as well. So, so saying there's not a big difference between what was there before well, the, and what's coming? The, the differences are welcome, I think, from a, a, a transport authority side, in that they, they offer more flexibility and, and, and a, kind of a, a wider range of, 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 kind of elements to be brought into it. But again, it, as most things do with transport, it comes down to funding. OK, thanks very much. Joe, yours is the next question. Uh, uh, let me start uh, by declaring I'm uh, the Honorary President of the Scottish Association of Public Transport, which I think relates to <coughs> the subject under discussion. Um, I had jotted it in this page of my notes. I should have done it earlier, if you know, as you might point out to me. Um, just looking at the, the bill, um, and this whole section <coughs> is probably one of the meatiest parts of it. It's 18 pages of the bill. Um, and it and it essentially deletes in the 2001 Act the bit that relates to partnership, which is more or less the same size. So it's a, taking something away and putting something in. And when you actually put what's taken away alongside what's being put in, it's actually quite difficult to work out what the difference in effect is, to be blunt, apart from those difference in terminology. Uh, I wonder if you can just actually help us understand what the difference is, 
or tell us that you don't understand and perhaps help us understand what questions we should ask the government when they come along to account for their uh, the, the, the changes they propose. Just, just before you answer that, that, that isn't a trick question. Stuart will no. have uh, analysed it with, with, with a forensic microscope, so be prepared to justify your answers. Who'd like to go first on that? Uh, <laughs> that one? Yes. But, uh, not today, but I will come back. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought you were going to come back on Zoom. <laughs> Can I make the observation? And I've known George Mayer quite a while as well, not as long as Maureen, possibly. If George Mayer can he answer that question on a pretty fundamental part of this bill, I think this part of this bill we're going to have to look at very intensively indeed, A, to understand it, and B, to make sure we get a good case put to us for what's proposed or for us to reject what's proposed altogether. So, George, you can definitely come back to yeah, us. I, I, I'll do that. Um, it's maybe that I'm getting older and I'm getting forgetful, but I, I, I like the opportunity to sit down and study it. And I should, I should make a confession as well, that if we're in con con confession mode, um, I only played a small part, honestly, in helping Moyer build first. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, OK, we're going to move swiftly on. David, you, you had something to say. It was just that. a comment that I, I probably um, don't fully understand the differences. Uh, reading through the part, I, I did strike me that, the, that one of the key differences was seemed to be the requirement of a local authority to um, make a plan and then report on it every year, which seemed to be to be adding to the workload of, of hard-pressed public transport units. Um, so I thought the, the main difference for me was it's actually going to add the workload and resource for local authorities, which might not be smart. OK, so no one else is jumping up and down to say that they've recognised the differences. Do you, do, you, do you have another question on that? Or? Uh, I, I really don't. I think the silence is the answer to the question and okay. leads to other questions later. Um, John, yours is the next question. Yeah, OK, thank you very much. We'll have another, another go at this. I think earlier on the phrase balance was used. And, and with regard to um, the local service franchises, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for instance, we hear from Fife Council, and I quote here, the proposals are lengthy and prescriptive and will certainly be challenging for any local authority who attempts to implement a franchise. And the question is about the balance and the process of developing, auditing and indeed approving a, a franchise scheme. Do you think that balance is right? to justify the intervention in the bus market. Um, and, uh, at all. I'm, I'm sort of looking across the panel. Um, Chris, do you want to go? Uh, so this is specific questions about the franchising component of the bill. Um, perhaps it reflects, it depends on the scale of the local area. If you were trying to um, franchise a bus network in Edinburgh or Glasgow, for example, uh, the implications in terms of staffing j just to establish what you want to be in that network and the financial reality of that plan is enormous. And as we said in our written evidence, I think it's important not to underestimate the loss of transport planning expertise that has taken place across local authorities. So I would suggest it's not there at present. And that's not to be, not to say that you can't recreate it, but that will come with a significant <coughs> financial cost. Um, so I think the simple answer to your question is, um, franchises potentially are an enormous workload that I'm not, don't think local authorities are currently equipped to take on. I, I, I think we've got to learn um, because it's so easy to, to say, well, you know, if nothing else, let's just franchise it. But there are really huge issues in that. Um, and it, it is a very complex issue. And if I, I'm more than happy to come down here and pitch myself up in a room and meet with as many MSPs that want to chat through it as, as, as might be possible. Um, because we need to understand it. We need to learn from the mistakes that happened in the North of England, uh, the nexus um, aspiration to franchise. Um, because there wasn't the checks and balances being done, they got so far through that exercise 
to then find when it went to the final panel, uh, the traffic commissioner uh, led panel, the business case was totally flawed and they had spent millions of pounds to get to that point. So I think um, checks and balances are needed. Um, there's room for a dialogue around ultimately uh, for a a decision, um, but we need to make sure that it's robust. If it's going to go ahead, it's robust, it's financed properly, um, it, it's going to be there for five, seven years. Is it going to last that long? Because if you've done a well with the bus companies in the area, it's going to happen. So it needs to be, it need, there needs to be checks and balances. And you know, franchising is a nice word, but it has different meanings. Uh, the franchise we're speaking about here is closing the market. Um, only bus operators that will get a permit uh, to run into the franchise area will be allowed to operate. There'll be no other operators. So if a council decides to bundle up uh, their franchise package to include things like schools, contracts, um, bus services that might uh, see a, a, an operator's full range of uh, routes being removed from and, and putting out in a tender, if it happens to these businesses, because there's no job for them at the end of that. So you're speaking about some companies in some areas, if you bundle that package up, people that have been in operation for 70 years, we've members have been in operation for 90 years, and that franchise could kill them because it would remove, they had a potential to remove their contracts. So there's a lot to think about. And when you get to the point that you are shutting businesses, you, you need to do that work. It is, I'm, I'm glad that others find it challenging because trying to get my head around this. Can, can I pick up on three points then? And, and not to single out five, cause, um, but I'm just about to, um, because we've had a, we've had a lot of uh, response to this. But they, they highlight, and this is something that we've heard in previous weeks, that, 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 that the development of any franchising scheme would require a local authority to have access to the full bus patronage and revenue d data for an area. Now, we've heard this in previous weeks, that that would need to, if you're going to make any. Um, so if the panel could comment on that. Also, um, a, the, and, and Mr Mayor, you touched on this too, um, the, the, the role that the independent panel convened by the Traffic Commissioner, whether you would feel that's robust enough. And if I could just do one final one, if I may. Thank you. You have to be fine. Well, I'm quoting from the information about... But anyway, anyway right, I do... I do, I do, do Sorry, save I'm, your answer for Mr. Mr. Lyle. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to ask um, was, and, and this relates to one of your members, Mr. Mayor, who, who shared with me that one of the challenges when I asked about a specific route, he said, well, it's not financially viable. It could, of course, perhaps be viable if we were able to incorporate the school run. That would give us some resilience at either end of the day. However, that contract's been... Um, already um, committed for several years hence. So th th the limitations to some people's aspirations around uh, the more bus services and the impact that already committed school contracts have on that. Now, I know that's very wide ranging, including Mr. Lyle's question for which I apologize. Um, <clears throat> gee, it's, it, 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 it is really challenging. And the, uh, the, the Fife question data with a local authority? I, I think in these, if, if you're in that scenario, you, you, you've no option. Um, you, you know, if, you, if you look at the Manchester example just now, uh, <coughs> for um, the, the Manchester Transport Authority are spending over 11 million to go through the exercise. Never mind running a bus. This is just to, to decide, well, will we go down the franchise path? The operators involved in that have been so inundated with um, information requirements. Some of it they can't even, uh, apply, uh, can't even respond to it, um, that they've had to go to the Traffic Commissioner and say, look, we need some help here because we, we just can't deal with this. We have a business to run. Yeah. But, but, the, but, but you've just been telling us earlier about all the data that, that there's available and the smart ticketing and, and um, presumably yeah. already you're yeah. making projections on on routes that may or may not be run on the basis of information you have. Yeah, that information <coughs> would, would be required to be handed over, and the operators are happy doing that. Um, but it, it, it's, it, 
it then grows to, to things that you don't have information on. And you have to go back and say, we can't provide you with that because we've got it. Well, I think so, even bus operators can't provide something they don't have, but, um, yeah. but the information... Uh, are you aware of the, the, were you aware of that position there that we'd heard previously about you know, for informed decisions to be made, all the data about patronage and, uh, uh, and yeah, I, revenue? Yeah, I, 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 I know <coughs> that today, in some part of Scotland, a local authority will be sat with an operator discussing a bus route or a service or a connect, connect, collection of service. <coughs> and in that relationship, they will hear that dialogue. So, I, I, I've, you know, it, it happens. It, it's happening now. You know, we, we, we provide data to a multitude of different sources. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, it's just part of life. But if you were in that franchise scenario, there are things you would be required to hand over. Uh, but it's got the temptation to, to grow to an extent that you, you end up with things and questions that you, you can't provide data because of, it's near there. Thank you. John. Yeah, quite keen uh, to bring in Richard and, and Jamie because this has sort of straddled their area. And I'd quite like to sort of say to Emma that the, the whole issue of franchising and how that might affect the rural area would be quite useful to hear from you. But maybe I could bring in Richard and Jamie if they've got supplementaries to yeah. that. Earlier, I, I disagreed with Professor uh, David Gray, and I, I do apologise oh, yeah. about that. But the point is, Strathclyde Regional uh, Council, uh, former area, is run by Strathclyde Passenger Transport, SPT. And basically, as a council, I was a councillor for 30, very boringly for 30 odd years. Um, but I agree with you that the council should be running bus services. And I, I, you know, I've seen buses. North Lancashire Council buses sitting in the yard after they picked up the kids in the morning, and people kind of get a bus for Ben Har, Shots, wherever, down. So, why shouldn't councils run buses in areas where your operators don't want to go or whatever that, that bring people, let people come back out their villages, whatever? You know, they, they just can't, they're stuck there, they can't get a bus. So, I agree with your comments. And the, as I say, I do apologise for my earlier disagreement. I would like to respond to Richard. If you, if you have a partnership in place with your local authority, whether it's um, rural, rural, operation or urban, there will be different things that you can have dialogue on. Um, and it's not beyond the, the means of believing that that kind of discussion around, well, listen, You've, you've a, a bus that there's a school run in the morning, and it happens now. Some of them are linked into the bus network. Um, some people don't like that, but it's making best use of the, the uh, asset that, that's available to be used. So you have a school run in the morning, you go on and do a, a run on a route, enter peak, and then you go back to the school and do the evening run for the kids going back home in the evening. That happens. But that's the kind of dialogue that, that should be happening on the ground between the operator and the local authority. And if it's near, it's disappointing. If, a, if the new partnership scenario helps with that, then great. Emma, do you, do you want to just comment on the relation to franchising and moving in and out of areas in rural, rural scenarios? So this is quite a, a difficult one to get your head around for a, a rural area. Um, Quite often, if you're talking about things within a, a local authority boundary, quite often journeys go across those boundaries. And you would often get somebody, um, just one side of the boundary, who actually just needs to go to the main population centre just inside that one. So, you know, one of the things that all of this needs to be thinking about is how you ensure that those journeys still happen. And when you're looking at bus partnerships, you know, are those things taken into account? And it's, it's not just about what's happening within this area, but it's, it's about the, the bigger picture for people. Um, I have also questions about how it would impact on community transport operators who are providing a really important service and who are often able to provide um, a really not so uh, a really vital service for, for very few people on the basis of services which are provided to slightly more people and, and provide some kind of balance to their services there as well and, and how would they fit in the picture so it would be good perhaps for the committee to hear from Community Transport Association for Scotland as, as well um, on that side of things. Um, 
Apart from that, I'd, I'd probably need to have a bit more think about it, and I'd, I'd be happy to come back to the, the committee on that as well. David, do you want to come in? Yeah, just to say that in terms of the rural areas, I think that franchises can only work if um, regional transport partnerships had a more kind of formalised and, and kind of strategic role in that. I think there are so many cross boundary routes that might... I, I, you could just think, for example, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City, that Nest Trans would have to have a, a fairly important role. Same High Trans as well, TAC Trans. I think if you're going down the franchising route, you need to really uh, further empower RTPs. OK. Jamie, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and uh, good afternoon, panel. Uh, sorry I'm coming in at the end of the session, but um, I'll, I'll ask one technical question that links on from John Finney's questions around data sharing uh, uh, around uh, specific routes. And then I have a more general question just to, to take advantage of your expertise around the panel. Um, one of the proposals in the bill means that if an operator wants to significantly, significantly alter various service or cancel a service, and this is quite important because we get a lot of uh, correspondence on, on these matters, the local authority or the regional uh, partnership, the transport partnership, uh, can, uh, will be able to request specific data and service, specifically revenue data and patronage data. And that data can then be supplied to a potential new operator of a service uh, that's going to pick up those routes, perhaps under a subsidised model. Uh, does the panel have any views on that, or do you think that's a good idea? Uh, Gavin, do you want to go with that? I, I think it's, it's a, it is a good idea, because I think in that sort of situation, uh, an incoming operator needs to have the opportunity to get off to a good start, and, and if they have data available, uh, they can analyse that, and that will help them to design their networks, their routes. So. You know, I think the availability of that data makes a lot of sense in terms of the, uh, the incoming operator being able to provide a, a service for the, for the travelling public. Okay. Uh, George, do you want to add to that? Just to say that in, in a number of locations, if a service is being, is being deregistered, the operators are already sharing some of that data. Uh, that's helpful. Um, I, I think under these proposals, though, they would be required to submit 12 months of very specific patronage and revenue data around number of passengers, passenger uh, uh, quantities, um, and the, the, what journeys were made, etc. So it's a very specific set of data to allow the new operator to make an informed decision on whether it would want to participate in that route. Uh, that's, I think that's the key difference from perhaps what happens at the moment. Um, my, my, perhaps my, my final and uh, main question is really around uh, probably the conversation we had at the beginning of this panel session around uh, uh, getting people onto buses per se. And I've, one thing I've noticed throughout this process of taking evidence and reading correspondence from people is how very centred and focused it is around uh, the, the franchise regimes that we operate in specific asks around bus lanes, etc. But do you think as a country we really are not being visionary enough when it comes to use of technology and infrastructure and how we spend our money? Now, over the last 10 years, the government has uh, uh, been uh, building a lot of concrete infrastructure. If you look at the M8, M74 uh, project, um, currently A9 dueling and AWPR, even things like the Queen's Street Crossing, it's, it's lots of more road space. But nowhere have we seen any uh, dedicated space for buses or bus type technology. And by that, for example, if you look at what they're doing in Cambridge, using guided buses, uh, a new type of technology, if you look further afield at China, uh, they're building build, uh, bus bridges, which are uh, Google them, they're, they're impressive. Um, so are we spending our money in the right way in infrastructure when it comes to future-proofing uh, our bus networks and, and improving modal shift? Um, that's quite a wide-ranging question, and I'll give, you each, yeah, I'll give you each a very short answer at it. So, Gavin, you can start it off. We'll work that way around and come back to George. But short, please. Short. Uh, uh, the short answer is no, we're not. And uh, yes, we should be. Uh, th there should be much more money going in to, to help passengers get to where they want to get to reliably and safely and quickly. Emma. Yep, yeah, uh, future proofing any bill is, is a difficult job, but um, there are incredible advancements in transport technology that are coming forward at the moment, and it's really important that the bill looks at that and thinks about how to ensure that that technology is used for the benefit of everybody living in Scotland and doesn't rely on purely a commercial basis for development, in which case it will benefit the urban areas much more strongly than it will benefit the, the rural areas. 
Chris. Um, yes, you'll not be surprised to hear us say that we believe more um, resource should be focused on the most efficient means of getting people about, uh, and, and I'm not going to li list those. Um, there's an element of, of I think, of, of, of what you said about, about technology, uh, yes, uh, but with a note of caution, uh, I was going to say, do not believe everything that Elon Musk suggests. Uh, there are a few very fanciful ideas there about what technology can achieve, and sometimes it's a good idea just to kind of step back a bit and have a think. David. Um, uh, yes and no. Um, sounds like a good politician's answer. Sounds like a, well, well <laughs> intellectually, academically, yes, we should. Um, in, in the real world, um, and I, I say this to a room full of um, elected members, is that road and bridge building in particular is, a, a, is very popular with the electorate and will ensure that you get re-elected, um, both at national and local level. Um, doing stuff that drivers dislike is a pretty good way of losing an election. Um, uh, and at M4 bus lane, for example, or, or uh, I've seen, um, so George will know how well bus priority is played in Aberdeen from time to time with, uh, with voters and with the, with the press and journal. And uh, sometimes you have to make pragmatic decisions as elected members. George. Um, I've never to surprise you. Um, I, I think we, we do need help. Um, that would be my biggest plea for this industry. Um, because if we did not tackle the bus speed issue, um, I think David Begg hot it in the nail, the bus in the industry will continue to die. But I think if you can inject some money in there to the bus companies, improving infrastructure for the customer, making it nicer to travel, getting them through the traffic congestion, then it helps everything. It will help with the environmental challenge. It will reduce car journeys. And, it, you know, I think there is a growing awareness that we, we need to tackle this. But unless there's the money to do it, um, we need to go. It would be hard, difficult decisions, but the right decisions. David wants to come back in. Not just the money, but the political will. And, um, and, and they both need to go hand in hand, uh, because without the political will from, from members and, and local authorities, then it doesn't get done, as you know. Diplomatic can say it's going to be difficult. <laughs> it will be difficult, but we have to get on with it, because um, we're at a stage now where we're looking at air quality, low emission zones, and if we don't tie into that and do the things that we need to do to manage traffic, it's a missed opportunity. So, George, what, what you're saying there sort of echoes, I think, what I was asking in the last one was speeding up the buses, but also speeding up the information that's available to passengers to make sure they know when they can travel at the most effective time to them in the most effective way. So that's all about information technology yep. at bus stops and apps and all the rest of it. Sure. Chris? Um, I, I was, yeah, I was just, just going to pick up that, and particularly given the... Uh, the discussion that took place at the last session on, on real-time information uh, where you touched on the issue about compatibility. Um, sorry, smart ticketing I was talking about and, and, and the difficulties with that. There's also actually an issue to do with information um, and real-time information that some bus operators, um, for whatever reason, uh, are engaged in equipping themselves with information technology that's not compatible with, for example, real-time information displays on, on streets. And that would certainly be something I would encourage the <coughs> Scottish Government to roll into the, whatever it's doing on smart ticketing. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a Betamax VHS situation on, on, on real-time, which should be uh, daft. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us really, I think, to the end of our questions. George, I think you kindly volunteered to uh, help Stuart on the definitions between the two sections um, we've, oh, and all of the committee, I'd have to say. So I look forward to seeing that. And I'd like to thank you all for your time this morning and give it evidence to the committee. And that now concludes our committee's business today. So therefore, I close the meeting. Thank you very much.